Welcome everybody on this rainy spring afternoon. Uh, this is the last in a scheduled, last scheduled business and society event of this academic year. Uh, previous events in the series have explored topics such as race and business education, how to build toward a more racially just workplace and C-suite activism. We've been honored to have speakers ranging from the top business schools to renowned authors to C-suite executives and even young business leaders. Um, I'm really delighted today to be joined by five dynamic members of the entrepreneurial ecosystem from diverse backgrounds. We'll hear more about those in a moment. Um, but before I have them chime in, I just want to lay out how things are going to be running today during the panel. So by way of noting that the panel will be ending at 1.15 p.m. Eastern time today, um, we I'm going to ask some questions that I have prepared to begin with. Uh, and then we'd love to, before the end of the panel, uh, ask some questions from you as well. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature on Zoom to submit any questions you have for the panel. Thank you very much. So um, in lieu of reading some boring pre-canned intros of our panelists, I'm going to have them actually introduce themselves to you. Uh, and part of the reason I've asked them to do that is because I think it's really important to highlight that the career path to get to entrepreneurship or the entrepreneurial world is very diverse and varied. And I think you'll see that by hearing about all the wonderful things that our panelists have done prior to their current, uh, what they're doing currently. So I'm going to ask them to tell us a little bit about their background, what they studied, types of jobs they had, and then what inspired them to join the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and then finally to tell us a little bit about what they are doing today. Um, so I'll just do a quick intro of myself and then I'll call on the panelists. So uh, my name is Rashmi Menon. Uh, I am your moderator today. Uh, I actually grew up, I'm an Ann Arbor native, uh, but unfortunately I didn't stick around for school. So I got my BA in economics at Harvard and I got my MBA at Stanford. The early part of my career was at larger companies. I did corporate strategic planning and product management at Disney, Microsoft, and Yahoo. And then I made my transition into the entrepreneurial world after that. I co-founded a company which helped school districts go green. Uh, and the reason I decided to make a transition to entrepreneurship is because um, I really wanted to have an impact with an uh, idea I felt passionate about and have really kind of broad input into how the company functioned and ran. And I also felt that entrepreneurship brought out some of my own personal strengths. So it was a really good fit for me. Um, I continued to work at a couple of different startups. I also started a consulting company that worked with startups and eventually found my way into academia uh, and made the move to Ross about five years ago. I currently teach a number of entrepreneurship classes to both undergraduate and graduate students. And I'm also an entrepreneur in residence at the Zellery Institute. So I'd like to go ahead and ask Elsie to tell us a little bit about her background, how she got here, what she's doing today. Sure, thank you, Rashmi, and hello to everybody. I'm super excited to be here um, to have an opportunity to speak with you all. Um, as Rashmi mentioned, my name is Elsie. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, 313. Um, I also ventured away from the Detroit area to go to undergrad at Boston University where I studied advertising and business marketing. Um, after that, I had a chance to uh, move to New York City, where I spent most of my career, about five years, in the creative marketing realm, really focusing on the executional pieces of the marketing funnel. So creating commercials, doing production, um, digital marketing campaigns, influencer marketing, and things like that. And then the latter, uh, maybe year, year and a half um, in New York, was working brand side at Verizon and Telco doing digital marketing management. Um, during that time, I really realized, you know, I had really conquered or really had a great time doing creative advertising and marketing, but I really want to be closer into the product. And, you know, that could have been product strategy, business planning, product marketing, and things like that. So at that time, I decided I wanted to go to business school to be able to switch careers because I didn't have a technical background. And I just wanted to learn a little bit more. So I decided to get my MBA at University of Michigan's Ross School of Business, Go Blue. Um, really for two reasons. One was because I wanted to switch into big tech, and two is because I really wanted to explore the entrepreneurial ecosystem um, that's out there. So when I went to University of Michigan, I was able to do both. Um, first, I successfully recruited in big tech and secured a job in product marketing at Microsoft, where I work now full time. And then second, I was able to start to explore the uh, ecosystem of venture capital by first doing um, uh, one of the funds that we have at Michigan 
And eventually I, um, along with my husband, we opened a uh, restaurant concept called Breadless, which I'm so excited to talk to you all about today. So that's my spiel and I'll save the rest um, for our panel. Great. Great. Why, don't, why don't we, thank you very much, Elsie. Why don't we have Mark, uh, since he is your co-founder and partner uh, in life to tell us a little bit about uh, uh, your background, Mark. Yes, absolutely. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. I'm Mark, or otherwise known as husband of LC. Uh, and I grew up uh, right down the road from Detroit in, in Cleveland, Ohio, originally uh, born to a, a super mom who raised my sister and I uh, by herself while being a public defender in the city of Cleveland and very grateful for a lot of opportunities and scholarship to be able to go to a top private high school and then uh, off to Brown University for, for undergrad. I was a business econ major, got to play sports and run track there, and then found my, myself on Wall Street, uh, really because there was just opportunities presented to me, and I thought it would be a great way to develop a great skill set, and, and while, while being in, in an exciting city, working on some transformative uh, transactions. And so I worked at Goldman Sachs for several years as an investment banker, and got to help uh, financing for the 49er Stadium and the sale of DirecTV to AT&T. Uh, then I worked as a private equity investor at the Carlisle Group in New York as well. Uh, and then before getting my MBA at Harvard in Boston, and then I became an entrepreneur, you know, turn, turn of events. And, you know, ultimately I became pulled, not too dissimilar from, from Rashmi, from a, to a higher calling to really utilize the skill sets I developed to make a significant impact on the life of others. And Breadless kind of, you know, honestly manifested through me. Growing up in Cleveland, we didn't have a lot of access to healthy food. And my mom working to support two kids, it was just uh, it, it really burgers, fries, fried food, and bread were the options. And that's not conducive to an active, healthy lifestyle. And so I was the guy eating, uh, trying to eat healthy my entire adult life, and it was really hard. And Breadless sort of manifested through my own experience, through a higher calling to bring these options to everybody nationwide and create a home for those who have always had to order off the menu. So we'll talk more about it, but yeah, Breadless is a quick service restaurant that serves savory on the go Breadless sandwiches made with leafy super greens, like red Swiss chard, turnip greens, collard greens, active nutritional value with chef crafted combinations. And we are starting right here in Detroit. We're opening our first location in the next two months, right off of the riverfront in, in downtown Detroit before we expand nationwide and super excited to be a part of uh, the journey in, 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 in Detroit and in Ann Arbor before we go out elsewhere. Mark, you're making us hungry during this lunch hour here. It sounds delicious. Thank you very much. Harlan, go ahead, please. Everyone, great to connect. Harlan Pacheco, uh, grew up in Colombia, Texas, Michigan, did undergrad at Michigan, went to New York for a while to do community development, youth development work, and then briefly to work at Major League Baseball in the World Baseball Classic. I then reached this um, ceiling that we were all quite familiar with, those of us that went to Ross, thought that I wanted to broaden and scale up my impact in the world, and so returned to business school. Which is kind of ironic because uh, during my undergrad years at Michigan, I spent much of it uh, protesting against many of the corporations that went to the business school. And um, then I only to realize that many of the tools of business could be helpful at accelerating impact. Um, I launched an education technology company after business school. It's called Clovey. We raised venture capital from Gates Foundation, K4 Capital. I ended up selling it to a, another slightly bigger startup. I did strategy consulting at Accenture. Uh, then I worked for a family office and a couple of foundations on investment strategies. Then I jumped back into entrepreneurship, a company called Up. It's a ride hailing and delivery model in Latin America, very similar to a Gojek or a Grab in Southeast Asia. I scaled it from one country to eight countries, from one product into four products, raised about six million bucks in venture capital for it. And uh, at the end of last year, I, I um, was having this nice conversation with uh, my wife about where I'm at in life. And traveling every other week to Latin America was gonna be difficult because we now have a two-year-old son. Um, my wife, who also attended Michigan, and whose sister is at the Ross School of Business right now, Juanita Leveroni. Um, and I decided that um, uh, it'd be better for me to be stateside for a while. So I'm now working in corporate business development strategy for Microsoft Viva, a new employee experience platform that Microsoft offers. Very excited to be here. Thank you very much, Harlan. Marlo, go ahead, please. Sure. Hello, everybody. I, um, I'm, as, I'm from Detroit as well, from the 313. And growing up in Detroit, um, what I noticed was that a lot of the strip malls that existed in Detroit, they looked like they were supposed to have businesses in them and they didn't have businesses. 
And even when I was a young child, I just thought that was a real disconnect when I went to visit cousins and things in other neighborhoods that weren't necessarily higher scale than mine, but their, their businesses were there and mine weren't. And I always thought that that was a missing. And so like entrepreneurship is something that has driven um, my journey all the way through. So um, I went to Michigan State for undergrad and marketing. Um, I went to, um, I worked at Kellogg in sales in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was an interesting experience of selling to people who are probably the exact opposite of me. I worked in rural stores, um, usually with folks that weren't necessarily in steeped as in education, were definitely from the South, were maybe a little bit older and just completely different from me. And I learned a lot from that. I came back to, to Michigan um, and went to the University of Michigan. It wasn't quite Ross at that time, it's been a long time. But um, when I graduated, it made that transition. And what um, I did from there was work for a very tiny amount of time with Ford and their marketing, uh, marketing leadership program. But I got really interested back again in entrepreneurship. And from there, I worked in startups, worked in the entrepreneurial ecosystem and have done that work for about 20 years. Um, what I've noticed in starting companies and in studying companies, because I, I got my B PhD in business anthropology, which actually is a really interesting place to study business. Um, what I've learned over that time is just that a lot of what we're dealing with around culture, around um, barriers to entrepreneurship really has a, a much deeper, uh, there's, there's a much deeper way to access it. Um, since then, I joined TechTown for the second time, and now I direct the technology-based programs at TechTown. So anybody that wants to start a tech business in the city of Detroit, I'm definitely interested in making sure that we help them because my mission is to make sure that we have a big pipeline of tech founders that are in and of the city of Detroit. That's an excellent mission, Marlo. Thank you. Uh, Vasco, go, get, go ahead, please. Great. How you all doing? My name is Bosco Bridges. Um, you know, I come I come to this work uh, from a, a long family of entrepreneurs, and to me, entrepreneurship is the thing that list, lifted my family, uh, extended family, out of uh, racism and poverty in rural Mississippi. Um, both from landowning farmers, uh, from in my great grandfather to my uh, my uncles who uh, who owned cab companies and and taxi stands way back in the day, to my dad who started a computer software firm, or my uncles who uh, and my brother who lead independent um, medical practices now. For me, I was like, you know what? Um, screw that! I'm going to be in the music business. So I left and went to uh, uh, Rice University undergrad, uh, NYU for gr first grad degree, and focused my first part of my career in the music. Business business um, until finding my way with Ross where I graduated 2010 uh, with my MBA and went on a more traditional business path. My um, place I landed in this entrepreneurial ecosystem though kind of coming back home to my roots if you will um, really it, it, it leads myself to two current roles. So did a traditional consulting path uh, advised entrepreneurs. I also led the uh, 10,000 small businesses uh, incubator program for Goldman Sachs in the city of Chicago, where we trained um, um, entrepreneurs who were more plumbers than businessmen to really teach them the basics of business. Uh, but for me, uh, my current roles, I have two, I wear two big hats that sort of put me squarely in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. The first one, I'm the chief of staff to the chief distribution officer at Northwestern Mutual, where um, we uh, create the ecosystem that helps drive uh, 7,000 financial advisors, all independently run, all running their own financial practices to help advise clients and wealth management clients on, on their, to help them uh, lead a life of financial security. Um, and so building the ecosystem uh, that helps them all thrive. But also um, for the last almost 10 years, um, my father very suddenly passed away while I was working at Deloitte in, in that cool post business school job. And so I've also been the CEO of our family business, Jono Technologies, which is a computer software firm focused on delivering software, IT services and technology needs to uh, the counties and municipal governments of central Illinois from our headquarters in Jackson, Mississippi. So um, excited to, uh, to join both from a ecosystem minded perspective, but also a, a legacy entrepreneur perspective as well. 
That's great, Moscow. Definitely sounds like you have your hands full there. A <laughs> lot going on. Thank Indeed. you for joining us today. Um, so as I was perusing some of the questions that uh, the audience submitted as part of the registration process, about 80% of the questions were basically, how do I get funding? Um, so I figured we would cover that topic a little bit first. So I want to broaden the topic a little bit. Funding is, of course, instrumental to starting many companies, but that's not the only resource that's important, mentorship networks, et cetera. There are many, many resources entrepreneurs need to become successful. So I'm going to ask a couple of our panelists to tell us a little bit about the resources they required to start their company and where they were able to find some of those resources. So Elsie, if you could start, please. Sure thing. Sorry, I was struggling to find the mute, the unmute button. Um, so for me, uh, I really started with University of Michigan's uh, resources at large. So um, when we got started with Redlist or the idea of it, um, again, I already knew that coming to Ross, we had an existing ecosystem for entrepreneurs. So I had already, not knowing what ideas I would have, I knew that about the Dare to Dream program. Um, you know, the Applebaum Fellowship, the uh, Michigan Business Challenge and things like that. So honestly, went after all of those. We submitted our concept and ideas to Dare to Dream for, um, we actually started with the, uh, there's three different rounds you can do. We started at the round two because we already kind of had a, a proven concept and we're already at pop-ups and gyms and things like that. So we decided to go through that resource. And I believe at that level, you receive $500. But really what it was about was um, that mentorship, being able to collaborate with other entrepreneurs that may or may not be at the same level and learn from each other, to have that cohort mentality and really, um, you know, the faculty and staff that were available for us to ask questions to um, and help to build frameworks around what we need to do next with the business. So we definitely started with Dare to Dream um, with the Zell Lurie Institute at Ross, which was extremely helpful. Um, we also uh, went into the, the Michigan Business Challenge, um, which was awesome and really helpful for us to understand, you know, how do we prepare for pitching? Because that's something you need to do uh, formally and informally as entrepreneurs. You have to always be selling, you have to always be pitching. You need to have your story together. You need to know what it looks like in terms of what due diligence questions will potential investors or people in, that are interested ask you. So um, those were some of the resources that I went after as a student. Um, we definitely had other resources that, you know, Mark can probably speak to with the um, actual funding and investing, but as a student, those were the ones that um, I really focused on at Michigan. Okay, great. Um, why don't we hear from Mark then on the funding side, and then we'll move on to Harlan as well. So Mark, go ahead, please. Yes, yes. Uh, so a couple of things related to this. So, so mo we closed a, a $1.1 million equity financing round uh, before the end of uh, 2020. And our lead investor, Calvin Puri, had seed funded like Sweet Green, Warby Parker, Allbirds, and Detroit Venture Partners, also another uh, investor in us as well. So super excited for that, that Detroit uh, ecosystem that's been helping us and hugely supportive and, and excited about the University of Michigan support that they provided us along the way as well. Very grateful to be a company coming out of there. Uh, but I think an important thing related to fundraising is even though Technically, we were fundraising for just a couple months. I really see it as that process started uh, back when I didn't have healthy things to eat in Cleveland when I was a little kid. Right? Like this is a lifelong manifestation in the that culminates in funding at that period of time. And, and even when we thought of fundraising or when we thought of the concept for Breadless in February of 2019, it then was a significant process to get to the point of, of actually formally uh, fundraising because the, the fundraising in itself is, is literally just about transferring confidence right or certainty to an investor who wants to give you money that's going to make them money over time and so in the early days when you don't have a significant amount of revenue or cash flow etc it's about investing in you and any credibility or traction that you develop to that point and given you know i had never launched a quick service restaurant chain before, uh, one of the, my initial thoughts was I need some credibility and I need to understand the space better. I actually got a job at Jimmy John's as a sandwich maker uh, for, for minimum wage to just learn how to operate like a quick service restaurant. Uh, and then additionally, I realized there's gonna be a lot of things that I don't know and I don't even know what I don't know. And so then it was, 
is how do how can we speak to as many people as possible who know a lot about this space and so leveraging friends of LCs of, of other friends to of, who've who've opened restaurants before and how can we learn from you. And, and then it was uh, making sure that we are just getting our, our product out there and, and getting traction, right? So we just started doing a lot of pop-ups and catering throughout Michigan. And all of that was, was to help build and just get the product out there, get real market feedback and reactions. Then when we speak to investors, we have a story to tell and we can tell them how customers are assigned to our product, et cetera. But ultimately it came down to those investors believing in us as a team, realizing that there's going to be a lot of things that were the barriers that we're going to encounter. And are we going to be the ones to help get over those barriers and to help make it happen? And so because we didn't have a you know, significant cash flow or anything of, of which to make on. And then in terms of how do we connect with those investors, that really came down to starting with, well, what do you have now based on your credibility? And some of that is our own uh, networks, right? So people who don't necessarily uh, know a lot about Breadlist, but know that we're people that they would want to back. So a lot of, you know, we started with friends and family, uh, first and foremost, and former bosses who just said, I know that you're someone who's going to hustle and is really passionate about this. So I'm willing to take a bet on you, uh, but also still wanted to, you know, try the product and, and get, you know, get, understand the validation. And then once we were able to have that initial traction and exposure amongst people who believed in us, we would then turn to more of the third party type individuals who were continuing to, let, to think about the credibility that we had already built. And we ended up, and that also though came through referrals. So we went to look at who's everybody who has been relevant to investing in like the quick service restaurant space. And we're able to find a list of those specific people utilizing actually resources that Michigan was able to help us with, like pitch book, et cetera. And then we were able to figure out what mutual connections we had to those people um, just by plugging them all into LinkedIn and then reach out to the individuals who we who, who would provide us with an introduction to somebody ended up our lead investor was actually a referral through uh, an attorney of, of ours, right? And that's just where it started. And, and you only need one, right, to really get that momentum. So uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but happy to take further questions on it. That's a great summary, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, Harlan, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I don't wanna say I stumbled into entrepreneurship, but I kind of did. Um, I had a friend when I was in business school, uh, his name is Justin Portillo. Last semester, he said, hey, why don't you come on this bus down to South by Southwest with the Entrepreneurship and Venture Capital Club? It's supposed to be a pitch competition on the bus. And then in Austin, there's a pitch competition for the winners. So I didn't think much of it, but on the bus, I met some interesting, cool people. This was an 18 hour, 20 hour bus ride from Ann Arbor to Austin. Uh, we pitched this idea on the bus. We somehow made it into the finalists. We wanted to use uh, the emergence of mobile devices to embed literacy experiences that initially for adults. We ended up winning the little pitch competition in Austin. And suddenly the plans that I had post business school, which is to travel around the world were flipped on their head. I hung around Detroit and Ann Arbor after business school, met Marlo uh, in Detroit, uh, raised a little bit of, of seed money from a small incubator and started knocking on doors as, as, Mark, as Mark said, right? So I hit up old professors, hit up old friends, hit up old bosses, hit up old mentors and said, who, who knows how to raise money? I have no idea how to do this. Uh, do you know somebody that knows how to raise money? Do you know somebody how to, how, that, that has a venture capital fund? I didn't know anything about this. And people are very generous with their knowledge, with their insights. Uh, I, think, I think entrepreneurs and students always, always get this advantage of, of getting extra attention because there's a hunger there, there's a curiosity there. And, and um, you know, one might be helping the next, the next um, I don't want to say Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, the, the, the pattern matching of, of um, pale male and stale men is, is really dated. Um, so the next, the next leaders of color that are, that are all not billion dollar businesses. And so um, uh, I was fortunate. I eventually got introduced to folks at the Gates Foundation. I eventually got introduced to folks in Echo and Green. I eventually got introduced to, to folks in K4 Capital through the MLT network. And they believe in me, they believe in the vision that we had to close the, the literacy gap uh, between students of color and, and, and more privileged students uh, in many public schools around the country. We ended up helping about 10,000 students at schools across Detroit with uh, digital literacy experiences, scaled that company up, got it to an interesting place, 
And then we couldn't raise the Series A, which, which I think a lot of people are very familiar with. And so a company that did raise the Series A that was also in the Capital, Capital Portfolio bought the company. Uh, that company then since sold to another company called Waterford Learning. And I've heard that the product growth last year was about 10x year on year from 2019 to 2020. Uh, and so you know, who knows if we had raised that Series A, who knows where we'd be now. Doesn't matter. Uh, what does matter is that I did eventually get to go do uh, entrepreneurship again. A friend of mine who was in um, an Echo and Green with him, his name is Gary Mao. We were in Colombia and um, we, we got introduced to a company in, in Colombia called Picap that was doing motor ride hailing. I actually got introduced to it by a friend who was tragically killed last year and his name is Fahim Saleh. May he rest in peace. Um, and I was down in Colombia with Echo and Green running Impact Investing Conference got introduced to, to Picap through Fahim. And at that point in time, I had already done some investing. I had family offices and foundations with investment strategies. And I had picked up the investment bug, initially invested and then said, hey, uh, oh, actually the founders, I was at number three on the team. The founder said, why don't you jump on the team, help us finish the round and raise the first 3 million bucks through friends that I had met through Echo and Green. Raised another 3 million bucks early last year before the, the pandemic set in. We were fortunate to close that round. Uh, and what I want to say is that networks and intros and connections and learning that rejection is just a part of the process and um, and, and exploration for, for models that work and, and for networks that, that provide intros are all very essential part of the process. I think the, the NPV of relationship development is so infinite in this space and at any different node, you'll have the opportunity to unlock more opportunity and, and more um, and more connection. And I and I think that you have to have a hunger to go do it constantly. Um, you know, my first company raised four or five hundred thousand bucks. My second company I raised about six million bucks. When and if I return on entrepreneurship, I want to do another ten x. Um, and hopefully, a lot of folks here in the room will be a part of it in some way, shape, or form. It's a great summary, Harlan. Always be networking, right? That's definitely critical to all of these things you want to do. So let's move on and talk a little bit about um, the career path in entrepreneurship is challenging, right? We all know the stats that most, you know, most startups fail. It's a difficult path, as, as Harlan mentioned, there's gonna be a lot of rejection along the way. Um, so I'd like to focus a little bit on challenges that folks on our panel have faced. Um, some of those might be just channel challenges any entrepreneur would face, and maybe some of them are specific to being an entrepreneur of color. Um, so let's dig into that. Marlo, would you like to start, please? Sure. Um, right now at Tech Town, um, we have a program called Steep, which is supporting 50 Black women tech entrepreneurs. Um, it's co-sponsored by the National Science Foundation. And what's special about it is that it is, um, it is for Black women tech entrepreneurs, and it's created by a Black women tech entrepreneur, right? So. Um, what we're doing, and this does answer the question, believe it or not, but what we're doing is creating an experience that doesn't just work on the business model, it also works on identity as a tech founder. And one of the things that I found in, um, in having started a couple of tech startups and even being a non-technical founder is um, that there is, um, there's, a, there's a disconnect um, that, that that um, I had around the culture of tech, kind of what tech is and the culture that I grew up in. Like my parents are teachers. Um, we're from the city of Detroit. And some of the things that, um, some of the ways that, that kind of work in the tech world weren't things that I was used to, to being or doing. I was used to doing the work, not so much talking so much about it, um, not always selling, um, not always, um, maneuvering in the way that I think it's really important in tech, at least in the way that it's currently constituated, uh, constituated uh, to, to move. So um, I think that while, of course, the, the journey is hard for everyone, um, it is very different when you have imposter syndrome and when you're in a room where people think you're an imposter, that's, a, that's like a, a double thing. Um, additionally, the, the capital piece is, is, is an issue, um, particularly for Black women. Um, we're, not, we're often in the position, if we're thinking about high growth entrepreneurship, to be the most successful people in our family. So when we talk about a friends and family round, we are the friends and family that people would come to 
for capital, for money. So it's not a, a situation where you have a lot of folks with 50,000, 100,000 um, lying around to support your, your move towards this. And, and right now, um, the way that capital is currently um, done, it, it, it is around kind of raising, 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 and not so much around, okay, let's, let's see if we can actually make money, generate revenue, generate value, and things like that. So um, I think that just the, the, A, the fact that the, there's a different environment, B, the fact that that different environment does have a gender and a cultural um, presence around it, but people don't really, it's like the default. And so if, you, if, if it's the default, people don't think that there's a bias around it. It's just like, this is the way it is. No, actually this is something that doesn't connect with what, we're, what, what m many people like me grew up with. Those are things that, um, that make it even more fun and interesting to see um, black women tech founders succeed in these spaces. Um, because they are succeeding, you know, we got a, a group of 50 that are doing really interesting things. So um, I just think that those challenges, though, when they're not named um, and you don't see as many people um, as successful as you would like to see, then it's, you know, kind of placed on the people versus really accepting the fact that this is a, this is not a, a, um, a, a parallel or, or um, this is not like an even environment. Yeah. Um, Marlo, thank you so much for calling out some of those challenges. Would you mind sharing maybe one or two things you've seen either yourself do or the women you work with do to overcome some of those challenges? You mentioned that several of them are, are having good successes. How are they able to do that? What are some things they did to help with that? Um, actually, uh, the STEEP programs happens every Thursday night right now. We're in the midst of it. And what was interesting last night is we did an MVP um, boot camp. Basically, there's a woman named Sydney Davis who operates a company called Techwity. It's a no code app development platform, really love it. She herself personally did the boot camp that showed the people in this 50, the 50 women, um, you know, how to, how to use her product to create their own apps. And so um, the, the interesting thing was she as a developer, but more importantly, she as a black woman, bridging the women who maybe didn't realize that they can create an app that could sell and giving them basically a superpower and saying, hey, this is something for you to do. And so I think that um, what, what was really interesting is for people to lean into this, this space that people don't necessarily, that my participants didn't realize that was their space, that was a space that they could own. They could own owning their own platform. They could own um, you know, creating their MVP and not having to hire somebody else that they don't know. And the person who opened the door to that space was a black woman who had this company. Uh, that to me was a, a really a high point of this program. And I think just leaning into these, to answer the question more directly, leaning into uncomfortable spaces where you might not be the only person in the room or you don't think of yourself as being, oh, I can go ahead and do that. Just leaning into it and, and, um, and even succeeding, you know, kind of having breakthrough moments. That's great. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the entrepreneurship path does require coming coming out of your comfort zone or the usual zone you're in. And I think that's a great example of that. Um, Mark, did you want to add something to this uh, question of kind of challenges and how to overcome them? Yes. I, so something that Marlo said resonated uh, deeply, which is just like the aspect of a playbook. And I think that having access to a playbook and which could include knowing how to access funding could be knowing how to uh, just navigate certain environments appropriately is something that I certainly experience as, as a person of color and not coming from a family that has worked in finance or had a successful career in entrepreneurship and I've I've found that it, it requires uh, working, uh, it's, it's burning the midnight oil, if you will, to, to stay up extra late, to just learn as much as you can and to find the resources available. And I've been very fortunate to find organizations like which Marlo is speaking to as well to be very helpful through that, whether it was SEO in, in, or Twigo in, in finance to even just in the Detroit scene, there's an organization we worked with called a Grand Innovation that helps with sort of business planning for restaurants specifically uh, for us. And then there was uh, the retail boot camp through Tech Town that we went through as well to help us uh, learn the playbook, if you will, that we would have otherwise not known. And I think 
we just had to be very like humble and realize we don't know we don't know and, and not be afraid to ask a lot of questions from those who have answers uh which is which is what i would encourage everyone to do i think you know additionally just challenges of any entrepreneur are facing rejection. You know, for us specifically, we were going to raise uh, money for a restaurant concept in the middle of COVID, right? So naturally, there, there's a lot of people who are like, what is going on here? Like, what are you thinking? Uh, and, it, and, and I think in that instance, it was just conviction that it, uh, for a problem much bigger than, than, than us, right? That there's a lot of people out there that want access to tasty, healthy foods and Midwesterners don't have access to a lot of these foods. And somebody's gonna believe in us. If it's not to tomorrow, it's gonna be the day after tomorrow. And just getting comfortable uh, with that rejection and continuing to press on with the vision bigger than ourselves, right? Uh, and then I think also the concept of a failure uh, is something that every entrepreneur uh, is, is going to have to, to grapple with. And the, the best advice that someone gave me that, that we try to play as well is just, just go out there and try to fail fast and get your product out to the market and get real customer reactions as quickly and as, and as cheaply as possible, right? It's developing a thesis. And then for us, it was just getting the product into the hands of students, right? At Michigan, getting the hands of the products of people at gyms. Um, and that was something that we just uh, realized that we, we just, we need to um, have, just have conviction in what we're doing and get it out there and iterate. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, failure is just a path to learning, right? That's that's if we keep that in mind. Um, so you've probably heard that all of us on this panel have had to tap into a number of entrepreneurial ecosystems to help us get to where we need to go. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, what are things that could be done to create entrepreneurial ecosystems for entrepreneurs from a diverse set of backgrounds. So Vasco, we'd love to hear from you about this. Um, thanks, Rashmi. Um, what's interesting is um, and North, I use as kind of related to the last question around challenges as well, right? Um, I think one of the challenges that all of us face is the fallacy of American entrepreneurship. The idea that, oh, all you gotta do is work hard, have a great business idea and you'll make it. Not, not, not taking into account the structural um, barriers that are in place for women and people of color, whether it's funding or other things. And at Northwestern Mutual, right, we recruit and develop 3,000 new entrepreneurs a year into our financial advisor system. And what's interesting is, and we looked up and we have 76 managing partners who are sort of the leaders of our territory and sort of the pinnacle of that career. Of those 76, 74 of them were white men. There was one woman and then there was one African-American man. And we as an ecosystem had to tell ourselves, well, what are the barriers in place that are stopping our recruits, our entrepreneurs from growing in their careers? And what we realized was that a lot of these challenges were sort of just the fact that we all assumed that all you had to do was work hard and you were going to make it, not knowing that what work hard in some of our, our, our locations meant was showing up at Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., and many women who had kids said, I can't do that. So I have to leave this career. Um, creating incentives like, hey, if you do well, you get a new suit and I'll take you on the golf course with the managing partner. And the women said, you know what? I don't want to do that. Like that doesn't, that's not an incentive for me to be successful. Um, the, the idea that all you have to do is to talk to all of your close friends and family about financial services build your book of business from those closest to you. And that's how you start your practice. But what if you come from a community that doesn't have a whole lot of disposable income and, uh, and, and now has to, uh, has to drive uh, you know, miles to get to a closest bank? How are you gonna teach them about saving and life insurance and investment products, right? So like the things that we were telling our brand new entrepreneurs of here's what you gotta do to be successful, didn't really apply unless you were a white dude from the Midwest, frankly. And so what we had to be able to do is restructure the things that we were telling our, our entrepreneurs, training our entrepreneurs, developing our entrepreneurs to do it in a way that applied to them, their background, made them unique to who they were, but also fit them into the culture and into the, the systems that we put in place. Um, the best example of this was um, in training our entrepreneurs, we give them something called like red letter language, like here's how you close a sale, right? And 
uh, it turned out that that red letter language, when women would say it, turned sounded like a woman asking someone out on a date, not actually trying to close a sale. So uh, a woman stepped up and said, hey, I'm gonna create my own red letter language. I'm gonna call it pink letter language that is going to now apply for me as a, as a woman in this industry, a woman in this business so that I can ask for a new client, ask for a referral, grow my business, grow my book without it trying to sound like I'm trying to take a guy out on a date at night. And, um, and it's those sorts of nuances that you got to look as, a, as for those of us who run on ecosystems of entrepreneurs, um, and, and those could be funding ecosystems, those could be development ecosystems, those could be government ecosystems. Um, realize those little things, those little tweaks that when, we, when, when those systems were created were meant for people that didn't look like us or came from our backgrounds and, and require and push for those changes. That's great. Thank you, Vasco. Uh, Marlo, would love to hear from you as well. Sure. Um, so one of the things that um, I noticed in the research that I've done and in the experience that I've had is that one of the most difficult things for, for um, people generally and then uh, people of color and women specifically to identify themselves as our techies and entrepreneurs. Um, and to combine the two is almost... Um, you know, is, is kind of a very intentional, purposeful thing. Um, and one of the programs that we do at Tech Town is called Start Studio. It's like our entry level, like gateway into the tech founder ecosystem. And when we started it, um, we were very intentional about language. And so when you see a lot of tech program stuff out there, they usually say something about like being you know, the, the language around is, are you a tech ninja or are you this or are you that? I mean, this, this language that, that doesn't, that automatically has certain people say, okay, that's not me. This is not what I'm trying to do. So one of the things that we did was we said, with this program, the, the, the question that we're asking people to ask themselves is, do you have a tech idea? Do you have a tech idea? And making it that simple um, not are you a startup, do you, not, not are you a business owner, not are you an entrepreneur, but do you have a tech idea? That allowed us to create a program that frankly is one of the more inclusive programs I've ever seen, um, not just in terms of gender and, 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 um, and ethnicity it's, and also race. It's also, you know, we've had people, we made it okay for people to bring their kids. We made it okay for um, you know, people who are much, much, much older to feel very comfortable. Um, and so, and, and really the outcome of that program was a go or no go on your idea. So making it really simple. Do you have an idea? Is this something that's been bubbling in the back of your mind? It's okay for you to test it out, try it out. And I think that that entry level, um, starting in that kind of way, I think, um, well, it's proven to us to be a very effective way of kind of enticing people into this ecosystem and saying, hey, this is something for you. Um, and then from there, you know, we can kind of just move them along. Um, and, and there's that, that identity that comes along with, with being in that ecosystem. That's great. Thank you, Marlo. Um, so I think some of what limits diversity, at least when we talk about the, you know, main types of startups that come up in the news a lot is they tend to focus on these very high growth, venture funded tech startups. But we know that there are many, many different forms of entrepreneurship. And I'm hoping that we could talk a little bit about that now is kind of what are some alternative paths to entrepreneurship, maybe government funded ventures, franchises, side hustles, lots of other types of businesses that are out there. So um, Mark, could we hear from you a little bit about uh, what's going on with Breadless in this area? Yeah, no. So, uh, Rosemary, I think I think you're, you're you're spot on that there's many different types of, of entrepreneurship. And uh, ultimately, I think going all in on a startup idea and leaving your job is, is not something that's necessarily for everyone. Right. And, and I know a lot of other people who may work nine to five and use their nine to five to help fund a, a side hustle or a consulting gig to help fund a side hustle until they develop enough traction and customers to have the confidence to, to take the leap. Um, and so, you know, something that we're very focused on at Breadless as well is create, creating our, uh, opportunities for hundreds of people eventually to become entrepreneurs uh, utilizing 
the system that we're trying to create here. I mean, ultimately, we have uh, breadless sandwiches that are tasty and nutritious and a very simple menu. Uh, and we have very small footprint locations as well. So we want to utilize that model to create opportunities for a lot of other people to become breadless franchisees at a much more affordable uh, cost than what they would otherwise be able to get access to with, with other potential concepts while they're giving the community members healthy food at the same time. So that So that's a way for you to become uh, an entrepreneur uh, and also give healthy food to the community, but not have to recreate the wheel 100% from scratch because we're trying to create a system for success. And our hope is that we can actually democratize health and wealth in communities everywhere and give these opportunities to people that would have not otherwise been able to raise the capital or to be able to who just have several hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars sitting in the bank account to make that happen, right? So franchising is certainly one of them. And, and we're looking to enable hundreds of people to have that opportunity. Um, and then additionally, there's there's models where people will take advantage of search funds, example, for example, to, or to raise some capital, go buy a small and medium sized business. And therefore, you're able to you know run something and operate it, but not have to recreate the wheel from scratch. So there's, a, there's an entire spectrum. And we're certainly trying to do our part at, at Breadless to make sure that we can create uh, a lot of wealth creation opportunities while making society healthier at the same time. That's a great vision for the future of your company, Mark. That's fantastic. Uh, Mosco, go ahead, please. Yeah, what's, what's, what's interesting, I was on a call yesterday that I had the former CEO of McDonald's on it and several other luminaries in the Black business community here in Chicago. And um, they realized that, hey, if you look at the Black enterprise list of top entrepreneurs, there's a good chunk of them, the most successful, that are McDonald's franchisees or franchisees of other, of other large uh, businesses or big suppliers to many of these companies who were built, whose businesses were built as part of supplier diversity initiatives. Um, and they particularly called out uh, a guy who started a business uh, building and get and supplying ice cream to McDonald's franchises. Um, and so um, understanding like what I, what I generally encourage people is why do you wanna be an entrepreneur? Do you wanna go work for yourself? Do you want to not have a nine to five? Do you want some flexibility in your life? Do you want to build a tech company? Or do you want to, as, as Marlo said, do you have a tech product or a tech idea that you want to see to life? Um, because there are a lot of reasons. If you just don't want to work for somebody, there are so many ways to just, as, as Mark said, go find a company and buy. I think there's, I think somebody told me that there are probably several thousand companies every year where call it revenues anywhere from one to $15 million where the founder is about to age out and retire and is looking for an exit, looking for a young start person who wants to take that business to the next level. So whether that's a search fund or other types of, of, of ways to, to take those, those second generation businesses over, um, I think you need to look at those. And there's some people who honestly are like, hey, I'm a consultant, I do what I do well, I just don't wanna work for anybody anymore. And there's so many subcontracting opportunities, whether it's from the federal government or Fortune 500 companies who have supplier diversity programs who can help you get that independent consulting business off the ground that, yeah, it may not turn into Facebook, but it can certainly um, help you sustain your lifestyle and give you the independence that you want as an entrepreneur. Vasco, I think you might have wanted to speak a little bit also about kind of government funding that's available and what might be possible there. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great call out. Thanks, uh, Rashmi, for that. They, for anybody who is, has an existing business, um, I would encourage you to, uh, and particularly um, um, people of color, women, uh, or other folks who are business owners, veterans, um, that there are certain programs for that, that whether they're local in Chicago, their state, state of Illinois, or the federal government, who have programs that can help both get your businesses started and provide not just capital, right? Like, yeah, you want some capital, but you also want customers. And there's no better customer than a federal or state government that can help you get your business off the ground by providing that a first initial subcontracting uh, opportunity. So I would just encourage you to uh, look at the local um, um, supplier diversity programs in your state and local governments, register, sign up, and once you do, pay attention to the RFPs and bids that come out that can allow you to gain a first really big customer. And that oftentimes is going to be your first million dollar deal could come from those type of uh, uh, engagements. 
That's great, Bosco. The Small Business Administration also has a number of programs, and that's at least a nationwide coverage. So I encourage you to check that out as well to see what may be available. So I am coming to the last of my questions. So audience, feel free to submit any questions you have through the Q&A uh, function on Zoom. We'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can. But I wanted to wrap up my questions by basically asking all of the panelists how do you get started, right? So if there's anyone on this webinar or who listens to it later, who might be interested in starting a business or becoming a mentor or becoming a funder or joining this ecosystem in some way, what are some good ways to pick up and get started? So I will start with Elsie. Elsie, go ahead, please. Sure, so I think getting started is like something that really scares entrepreneurs or anybody with an idea, just like I have to do everything. I have to be super methodical with how I start this process. And I think in my experience, you know, that's really important to have a foundation, a business model, an idea, et cetera. But what's really important is to start just like getting scrappy and getting out there and trying it, you know, like, so what the way that we got started was really, um, you know, as Mark mentioned, we started with uh, pop-ups. So, you know, we, our first one was in downtown Detroit. Um, my aunt um, works at this wine store called House of Pure Vin. And we got out there and we shared sandwich samples for free because we knew people would like to, you know, in the downtown area, they like to go to this store. It's a lot of high traffic and we just wanted feedback. So we created surveys on an iPad. We said, please try our products, sample it with this wine. It's a nice pairing there. And, you know, tell us what you're thinking. And that's how we started to get early, early feedback on, you know, we love the, your chicken sandwich or the tuna one is a little dry. Like, we wanted very, very um, raw feedback from people of the community. So that's pretty much what our model was as I um, went into my second year of University of Michigan as well. We went out to student groups, we went to faculty, we went to the Lurie Institute, we went to everyone and was like, you know, we would really like to cater your event, your student group or your symposium. Um, and we also want to track, you know, how people are feeling about the product. So everything was about pilot testing, beta testing, getting data, having customer interviews, you know, sometimes in-depth interviews, sometimes quick surveys. But for me, it's just like, get started, ask questions, see how you can ideate and iterate on the product. And eventually we were able to do that where we got to our core menu that people liked. We got to eventually start to cater larger events and have a, a model in which operationally we could, you know, be able to deliver what we needed to. There was a time, you know, my second year of business school where every weekend we were at a gym, a pop-up, or we were catering in downtown Detroit, we were doing a catering event at Michigan. So um, from there, we really understood, like, if we never tried to just get this product out there, or, you know, using commercial kitchens or whatever we had access to, you know, we would have never known that people really wanted this product. Um, additionally, to get started, I'm a big fan of data and research. So while I was in the um, Del Lurie commercialization fund at Michigan, which is an early stage VC fund. Um, I was looking into market sizing. I was looking into, um, you know, how many people are really like affected by my product. So for us, uh, as an example, for Breadless, we were looking at the 17% of Americans across the US that were um, low carb, no carb, they ate keto, um, they were maybe celiac or gluten free. So th that was already an existing target that was like not being tapped into. Sure. You might have competitors that offer a sandwich on um, a lettuce bun or whatever you want to call it, but it's iceberg lettuce. It has no nutritional value. Um, it's like the ad hoc order on the menu. It's not anything that's directly catering to them. So, and the upside is, you know, looking at research, there are trends that are going towards people being wanting to be more healthy, being more conscious of their health. And then when we looked at Detroit, again, which is my home, there's um, a ton of people here who suffer from diseases or things like diabetes, and that's really linked to food health. So how can we, as a, a product, meet those customers where they are, make sure we're accessible? Um, so we really got started with that research, with that pilot testing, and just getting out there and getting feedback. Yeah, definitely building a minimum viable product and getting out there is, is very, very important. Thank you, Elsie. Mm -hmm. So in the interest of time, I'm going to ask the remaining respondents, let's go Twitter style here, one or two sentences, and that way we can get to some of the audience questions as well. Harlan, go ahead, please. Sure. Uh, two quick things. I think your network stack is just as important as your tech stack if you're starting a, a VC-backed tech company. So know what your assets are in your network. Um, and, and, and use them. So Stripe Atlas now makes it super easy to, to go and incorporate. Low-code tools make it super easy for you to go validate something. 
Um, use Crunchbase and LinkedIn to figure out who is in, in your vicinity of, of your network to help you accelerate to that first step. And in and, 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 and response to kind of, early, and then, you know, go get a CTO if you're starting a, a tech company. Uh, my first CTO is finishing his master's in computer science at Michigan. He left an offer at Google to, to join us for my first company. I don't know if he regrets that or not, but um, the, 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 your network stack is going to give you access to who you need on your team and to who those first resources are to get, to get your company out the door. And then um, the other thing I wanted to add is also figure out your motivation template. I think, yes, we have a lot of barriers against us as black and brown folks, as women of color, a whole lot, but our motivation template is the strongest and it has persevered and persisted past colonization and all kinds of attempts to get rid of rights and all kinds of attempts to eliminate voices. And that motivation template is something no one can ever take away from you. Those assets, that hustle and that empowerment that you have is better than anybody else's. And it's, it's, in, it's, in, your, it's in, your, in your court to figure out how to, how to dribble down the other side and, and score lots and lots of baskets with it. Um, I'll, I'll close by saying look, one of the first things my mom said after I, I finished business school and, and went to a job that made zero, in fact, negative amount of money. She's like, well, where'd you get this crazy idea to go start a company? And I was like, where'd you get this crazy idea to, as a single undocumented mom, take a child to a new country? And she said, oh, I get it now. You're taking risks for a better life, just like I did. And that's what a whole lot of us have that no one can ever take away from you. Great story, Harlan. Thank you. Marlo, go ahead, please. Sure. Fall in love with solving the problem versus your solution right now. Also, there are more and more people out there that see inclus inclusion as a financial, um, as as the key to a financial upside. I'm co-founder of an uh, angel group called Commune Angels, and we're very specifically about that. Um, there are other angel groups and, and other venture capital groups who feel the same way. Find those folks, network. There, It's a good moment for them right now in terms of money. Mm -hmm. Go out and find them. Just fall in love with the solution, though, really. Music to my ears, Marlo. Thank you. Vasco, go ahead, please. I'll just, I'm going to say one line and it's like, understand your customers, not your product. More people have like, I got a great product idea that has zero customers. Figure out what your customers want first. Great. And Mark, anything you want to add to what LC had to say? I, a lot of incredible points here. I guess the only thing I would add to LC with, with that, to what LC said is uh, find something that either is really unique to you or you have a very unique insight or you're very motivated to accomplish. Like for me, I've been the guy eating this way my entire life. Uh, so it was deeply resonant in me, right? And then also to, to a lot of other points that I want to highlight there is, is also uh, be able to control your own destiny. So Arlen said, if you're a tech company, go get a CTO. For us, you know, even though we were baking sandwiches on our own and testing recipes, we realized we needed a chief product officer, which is our version of a CTO, to help us actually develop our core product and of, you know, red, of red Swiss chard, turnip greens, collard greens, chef crafted combinations to make our sandwiches to be great so that people even, unlike me, people who, are, who love bread, but still eat our product and enjoy it, right? Um, and then lastly, to what LC's point just said, just get it out there, right? So, um, you know, waking up in, in the 5 a.m. to go, go to the grocery store to buy produce and then make, find a kitchen, make sandwiches, all general managers at the gym so we can pop up and sell sandwiches, just get it out there in a very low cost way so you can, so you can iterate. Thank you so much. That sounds like the best chief product officer job out there, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. Thank you all. There's all some very great advice there to get people started. Okay. So I'm looking through some of our questions that have come through. So we have one, um, Harlan, I'm going to direct this one to you. The question is, is there a specific way to approach American funding being Latin? Um, I think I can be answered in a couple of different ways. Um, so if you're from Latin America and you want to go start a startup and go back to Latin America and start a startup, um, Latin America has one of the lowest in a regional basis, VC to GDP ratios of any region in the world, Sub-Saharan Africa is in Latin America are about just the same. Latin America has twice the population that North America has, is a bigger middle class in South Asia, and it has the lowest VC to GDP ratio. It's an arbitrage opportunity, and it's an opportunity to bring all kinds of efficiencies there. If you're interested in that, hit me up offline, and, and, I'll, and I'll be able to help you. If you're Latinx and want to do something here in the U.S. and or something that's transnational um, and or global in nature, there's also lots of opportunities to work with incredible entrepreneurs. Edricio de la Cruz, uh, a buddy of mine who went to Rento, Echoing Green, also got money from K4 Capital, has a transnational fintech company where his team is mostly in Mexico, but he also has a team here in the US and he's trying to make it easy for payment card companies to like 
program payments and program receipts and program integrations and new commerce platforms. He's raised like fifteen million dollars, and he has that that transnational experience. Um, so there's there's avenues on both sides, and I'm I'm happy to help. Um, check out LAVCA, L-A-B-C-A dot O-R-G if you're interested in kind of Latin American venture capital, and check out uh, if, if anything else. Just hit me up. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so Mark, I'm going to direct this one to you, which is basically around, you know, what are the downsides of bringing in VC capital too early in the process? So maybe you can tell us just more kind of broadly, how do you determine when to raise money? What's the right time? What are some factors that might drive you to raise money? Yeah, ultimately, uh, anybody who's investing in your company wants a return, right? And they're going to have expectations. So at the moment where you feel like you have something that can use their capital to grow your company in a, in a way that's going to uh, best reduce the risk of all parties, which means your valuation will be will be higher. And if you and if, uh, is the time that you, you might want to think about it, you know, for us, we realized eventually we we're going to need to raise capital, but we even thought about uh, whether we should use debt financing or equity financing, because this is basically a, a box that produces cash. So theoretically, you should be able to raise you know, debt forms of financing as well. It has a fixed uh, return as opposed to an unlimited upside uh, return. Uh, but that said, and because we're starting from scratch, we're starting from thing from zero, we wanted people who are invested in a line for, and who could be patient with us in 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 the the kinks along the way? Because we're going to need to figure a lot of stuff out. So we we wanted partners that believed in our vision that to, to enable us to to scale to to the reach nationwide that we wanted to be able to accomplish, and those that could help us build the network and the relationships and uh, and the appropriate other people and help us to recruit teammates that can help us achieve this vision. And equity investors are a lot more aligned to help you to do that. Even some of our first, one of our first key hires, for instance, was introduced from. Uh, Detroit Venture Partners, right, as and that's come onto the team and has been phenomenal, right, because they're incentivized to help us grow the company and also build Detroit. Um, so that's, you know, that's how I thought, that's how we thought about it, is we wanted partners that can help us to build something really uh, transformational uh, and impactful, and equity investors are most aligned uh, in, in that respect, and you want people who ideally are also in your industry or have some specific industry expertise or can connect you with people in the industry to help you uh, bring the appropriate people around you because it truly uh, takes a village. But of course, equity capital is, is absolutely dilutive. So that was to the point on, you know, bootstrap for as long as possible, right? Like the longer you can bootstrap, the more traction you can get with your MVP, the better it's going to be for you. And, and the second you have investors, they have a lot of expectations, you have reporting and all these things. So you want to be able to, uh, Keep as much flexibility as possible and really iterate as much as possible until you realize, okay, we're at a wall. We need capital to get to our next major hurdle. For us, we needed to open an actual physical brick and mortar. We were no longer just doing these problems. We needed that capital to help us accelerate and invest in our own growth. And so that's how we thought about that next step. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Marlo, we have a question from someone who wants to learn more about the system systemic issues that uh, entrepreneurs of color face and how to address those issues. Uh, sh uh, this uh, person wanted to know, are there any books or organizations, people, talks, resources that you would recommend they might uh, seek out to learn more about this? Um, for a deeper answer, I would suggest just connecting with me directly, but just to answer this uh, quickly, um, Digital Undivided produced a, a report that I was the co-author on for the first report called uh, Project Diane. Um, when you first started seeing uh, statistics around the amount of venture capital funding that um, Black women raised uh, versus others, that's where that, that information came from that research. Um, another place to look is the Kapoor Center. They've done a lot of research around um, inequity and, and high growth capital. Um, and and um, also at Tech Town Detroit, I did a, a white paper on radical inclusion in tech. Um, I, I don't want to always talk about kind of what's, I want to also kind of have a pro, proactive approach. And so I did research um, looking at places that did it well. And when I say places, I'm talking about accelerators, incubators, co-working spaces, and conferences. I've studied a few of them and, and came up with a few, few um, best practices. And that stuff is available free at techtowndetroit.org slash radical inclusion in tech. 
Thank you so much. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, there's a question about what is your opinion on startup accelerators? So I think Marlo would love to hear from your side with what TechTown does, but um, I don't know, Breadless or Harlan or Vasco, if you've had experience on the kind of participant side. Okay, why don't we have Harlow follow that up by kind of as a participant, what you got out of being an accelerator. So Marlo, go ahead, please. Sure. So I've, I've, I've participated probably on the accelerator, uh, on the participant side, as well as on the, on the pro proactive side. And I would say you need to find a match between what that accelerator is doing and what you are doing. I was a part of an accelerator where I think um, there wasn't as much of a match when there's a specific um, goal that that bigger accelerator has and it hasn't always matched up exactly who they're recruiting with, um, you know, with re meeting, meeting that goal, then you can end up frustrated. So just bottom line, don't just go for the money. Make sure that there is a good, alignment between their ultimate goals and what it is you're trying to do we're you know on the on the provider side we're always trying to get more impact um but we're not always um incentivized to make sure that we're hitting the home run and having a really big exit so really make sure that that match works out for you that's great thank you harlan do you want to add anything from your side Sure. I think all those points that Marlo mentioned are very good. Um, knowing the, uh, the company team to accelerator match is absolutely essential. And, and, and knowing maybe the track record of that accelerator and getting to where you want to go. Obviously, you know, the example that everybody uses is, is Y Combinator. Historically, it's been super exclusionary, right? It had a terrible set of partners. But now there's somebody, Michael Siebel there, great man who's leading that organization forward and has diversified the heck out of it. Year on year, there's more women, there's more folks of color, there's more underrepresented folks that are represented in its, in its incubator classes. And I think they're not just a model for themselves, I think they're a model for other incubators across, across, um, across the country and the world. And, and we, we have a lot to learn in the Michigan alumni community and, and in the University of Michigan community. I, I would venture to say that our endowment has probably not allocated as much capital as it should to underrepresented uh, venture capital managers. And so, I, I would ask all of you to go knock on the doors of the endowment and go do that. That's, that's great in uh, capitalistic activism. <laughs> um, I think this is an interesting question about how to get support from your network, your immediate family and friends when you share your idea about building a business, knowing that they're more likely to be risk averse. I think all of us have heard that from friends and family in our past. So uh, Elsie, you're nodding your head. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you might handle this? Yeah, I think that if you exude passion and, you know, you're going to bring people along with you on the journey. And if not, you have to ask the question, you know, why? And that's where research, like we talked about, comes into it. But I think ultimately something that I think we all talked about earlier is that people are not only investing in your business, they're investing in you. So you have to do the job to convince them that, you know, this is something that's important. This is something that you think will be uh, successful. And you have to come not only with that enthusiasm, but also the research and the data to support and back that. And um, I think that for, for us, we got lucky with that because we, we did do a lot of iterations and a lot of testing and that MVP that we talked about. But um, ultimately it is that pitch. You have to learn the art of sales. You have to learn the art of being able to tell your story and bring them along with you and really do that convincing. So um, I, I am sh shaking my head because that's something that I learned a lot through all of the different entrepreneurial cohorts and things with uh, the Lurie Institute, learning that um, is really important to convince anybody to be interested in your, your product or business. So I think we have time for one last question and I may actually ask all of you to contribute to this one because I think it's a pretty general question, which is I'm gonna broaden the question a little bit. It's around what happens when you hear no, right? That could be no from investors, could be no from customers. How do you know you should keep working on this idea? What do you do with that when that happens? Uh, Cause it will happen <laughs> along the way. So kind of how do you relate to that? What do you do with that information? So I'm gonna kind of ask all of you to chime in a couple, couple sentences. We have a couple minutes left. Uh, so Vasco, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I think that the first thing to realize is you will never find an entrepreneur who did not hear no. And so that no will hurt. And then you realize, you know what, I'm just like everybody else, like everybody else had to deal with this. And so um, don't think of yourself as special. Just think of yourself as building something unique that you need to find the unique match, whether it's no from a customer or no from a, fun, a funding partner like everybody's not meant for you and you're not meant for everybody. 
That's great advice. Uh, let's see, anyone else want to add something to this? Harlan, anything you want to add? Sure. I think there's a whole lot more to learn from customers than there are from investors. You hear the biggest investors in the world have missed out on the most massive of returns because if they knew what to pick to move forward, they'd be operating and running that startup, which provides far more returns than trying to get the 20% IRR or whatever they've gotten for, for their old vintage funds. So um, learn from customers, selectively learn from investors. And if they, they reject you, keep it going because there's enough investors to go around. Um, especially now that equity crowdfunding rules allow you to raise up to $5 million a year from non-accredited investors every year. And folks like Arlon Hamilton got, and companies like Gumroad are taking advantage of it in, in the early days. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, all of anything that has to do with funding, build a solid business, the funding will, you'll be able to get funding, right? And it's the same thing. Listen to customers. Yeah, good. Uh, let's see, Marlo, anything you want to add? Not every note is the same. Just going along with what Harlan said. And, and no's are like burpees. You, you're going to learn from them. They, they don't feel good all the time, but you know, they kind of toughen you up and you can learn from them. Yeah. They make you stronger, right? Yes. That's great. I love that analogy. Mark, go ahead, please. Yeah. I guess just to echo a lot of the great points here, like you're going to hear a lot of no's and from the investor standpoint, the one way to counteract that is have a very large pipeline, right? It'd be the same thing if you were in sales, right? Uh, if one customer says no, well, you, if you have 49 others that you're going to call that one, no, does not hurt you as bad? or doesn't feel as bad because you have a long list of others that you're speaking to. So anybody going to fundraising process, I would encourage you to have a list of a hundred plus parties. And then when you're going on the list, you can now know, oh, there's 99 other chances because investors are trained to say no, right? Most VC firms want to say no so that they can move on to the next thing. So just know it's not personal, just, it, just play the numbers game. But from the customer standpoint, I'd also say, I know the reason why they're saying no. As they say no, I, I ask why, right? Like, what did you think? I uh, never just take a no and let it be a no with no incremental context. You want to constantly learn and get as much context as possible. You may just be talking to the wrong customer, but then if you, if you, if you, if you stop your idea at that point, you may have missed the entire niche that would have been your entire opportunity to make a stronghold on, on the market. Right. So ask why and, 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 and ask yourself why they might've said no and ask them why they said no. All right, Elsie, I can give you one sentence and then I got to close things up here. <laughs> Sorry. All I have to say is resilience is key. Very good. <laughs> Fantastic sentence. Great place to end. I want to thank all of the panelists. I want to thank Business and Society for hosting us today. Thank you very much to the audience for your great questions. This was a real pleasure. Thank you very much. And we hope we've inspired you to go out there and pursue your entrepreneurial dreams. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.